and still seeing that number climb. So we'll go ahead and wait a few, wait a few seconds. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm seeing a few kind of come on in, but let's go ahead and go over the agenda for the evening. But first, um, I want to good evening, everyone. My name is Maritza Gallaga. I am the Interim Chief of Public Affairs and Communications for Roundup ISD. And again, I'd like to welcome you all to our, vir our virtual community budget forum this, this evening. This is an important topic for our community. Our budget impacts everything we do as a school district, from the resources we're able to provide our campuses, our schools, our facilities, um, to how we're able to compensate staff. And um, so this is a really important district for us. And, and Round Rock ISD and school districts across the state are in this crucial planning process for the upcoming year. And there are many considerations and many factors and many challenges that are faced during a budget development process. And tonight, we're here to share some of those details with you and answer some of your questions. Um, so again, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of you for being here, taking time out of your schedules, and to thank our panelists as well. Um, for those who are in need of an interpretation service, ASL, we also have our ASL interpreter with us today. So wanna thank them for being here as well. Um, so still seeing a few people come in. So as we do that, I'm gonna go over and share a little bit about our how tonight will look. Um, so to start, we're going to introduce our panelists, and then we're going to give them the opportunity to share some information about the budget development process, the factors, the considerations, and the challenges that go into it. And once they're done, we'll go ahead and start taking audience questions. For those with us tonight, please use the Q&A feature. It should be below in Zoom to submit your questions. Um, we also did have people submit. We allowed our community members to submit questions via the submit question submission form earlier before this event. So we'll answer those questions as well. Um, we will go through as many questions as we can this evening. Um, but if you still have any questions that are left over or tonight sparks some new questions, please feel free to contact us through Let's Talk. Um, you can find that available, that feature on our, our district website, roundrockisd.org. And for those who would like to see this or share this with a friend later on, a recording of this event will be available on the district's website um, and shared on our social media platforms in the coming day. Now, now we'll go ahead and get started with our panel, our ex with our introduction. So to start, we're going to introduce some of our, our panelists. So we have Dr. Hafed Azaiz. He is the superintendent of schools for Round Rock ISD. Uh, so, well, thank you, uh, um, We are super excited to have this, this event because we want to make sure that we share as much information with our staff and our community as much as possible um, as possible about the budget but overall about what we add as far as this year budget and 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 beyond right so again super excited to be here uh we welcome all the questions and we want to work together with our community and our staff to make sure that uh, uh we are transparent with the process but also we're doing everything we can to ensure that our teachers and staff are well compensated and also we're providing every support that we need to provide for our teachers and and also our students so they can be successful so, and next up, and our next panelist is Dennis Covington. He is our Chief Financial Officer. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I would basically walk you off to what we call a basic budgeting 101 course, do a presentation, and I look forward to your questions. And then our, our final panelist, we have Eddie Curran. He is our Chief Human Resources Officer. Good evening, everybody. Um, I can't see you all, but it's nice to see you. Um, again, I'm going to follow on from Dennis's presentation tonight on the budget piece to talk a little bit about how compensation works in our district. And also glad to answer any questions that come up uh, towards the end of our, our, our evening together. So nice to, to be here this evening. So thank you guys. Thank you for the quick introductions. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Dennis and Eddie to share a little bit more about budget, budget development and factors and considerations and challenges. Good evening again. Next slide, Eddie. Tonight, we're going to talk about the four types of budget. Well, I'm going to show you the four types of budget funds. The maintenance and operations budget, which entails our daily operations for running the school district. Our interest in sinking fund, which is repays our bond debt. School nutrition and health services. Those are the four types of budgets that we prepare annually. But tonight, we're going to concentrate on the maintenance and operations budget. What are the major factors affecting the budget? Here you see a list of things that go into developing a budget for the upcoming school year. Any rules or laws that come out of state legislature, property value, the tax rate, enrollment and average daily attendance, inflation, 
Extra funding cliff and employee compensation, and we'll break down each of these a little more in detail. State legislature. How does the state affect our budget? First, the state uh, adopts a basic allotment. As you know, our basic allotment right now is $6,160 per ADA. And that's been in effect since 2019. The state also give us categorical allotments. These allotments consist of Special population, um, funding for special population for our children, for us like special ed and a few others, and I'll get to that in a moment. And also there's a law called recapture. And uh, I will also explain a little bit about that. The basic allotment. These are funds that the state appropriate for educating each child in the state of Texas. As I said before, it's $6,160. There's a bill on the house in the house that's proposed to take it to $6,250. To match the projected inflation rate, it will require an increase of approximately $900 to the base of allotment, taking that allotment to $7,060. These funds will greatly alleviate some of the funding issues that we have in the district. The categorical allotments, uh, we receive special funding for special education, our at-risk students, gifted and talented, career and technical education, have a separate allotment for safety and security, and one for transportation, to name a few. What is recapture? Texas recapture system requires the state to transfer local property tax dollars from districts with the highest level of property wealth per student in an effort to provide more equal per student funding across the state. This is called the Robin Hood Law. Take from the wealthy, give to the poor or educating students equally across the state. As you can see, our recapture was in 2021 was $16 million. As of today, it's projected to be 85 million and it could grow to possibly over a hundred million before the end of the year. Another factor in the budget is property value. First and foremost, the school district does not set your property value. It is set by the county appraisal office. Along with that, there are laws about property value. Your home property, meaning the, prop, the house that you live in, is capped at 10%. Now, if you rent a house to someone else that lives in and you still own the house, your residential property has no cap. Commercial property has no cap, and currently the homestead exemption is $40,000. So what is the tax rate for Round Rock ISD? On this chart, you will see that the tax rate for the MO budget has been declining since 2019-2020. And mainly this is due to the com maximum compressed rate, which is set by the state comptroller's office. This is the maximum that we can charge for taxes on your property. As you can see, it's projected for the 23-24 at 71.03 cent. Now, as you see on the like the fourth column over, all golden pennies. A district is allowed to have up to five golden pennies voted on by the board. You can have up to eight golden pennies, but after the five, you have to take it to the voters to get their approval. So currently, Round Rock ISD has the five golden pennies. So I projected M&O tax rate as of today, considering the maximum compressed rate is 71.03. You add the five cent to it. It goes to 7603. Now, this could change. I have seen some legislature where the maximum compressed rate may go to 74 cents, but that has not been said as of today. This chart shows a comparison of our tax rate to the surrounding ISDs. And as you can see, for the MO tax rate, Round Rock ISD charges the least amount of all the districts in this area at 8546. Another factor in developing the budget is enrollment. Um, our enrollment is declining. Uh, we had approximately 50,953 students on count day in October of 2019. And on count day in 2022-23, it was 46,680. And we are currently projecting a decrease of 188 kids for next year.
I just wanted to add on, on that slide as well, that our current enrollment is looking a little better right now. We've added some kids back into the system. So we're excited about that. I think our current uh, enrollment is 46,000 and just over 900. So 46,900 students. And then we've got some things in, in the works as well to, to really help with that enrollment piece. Um, you, you've probably heard uh, us talk about uh, at various board meetings about recruiting students to come back to the district. So we're seeing some success with that, where we're actually going out and and, and really inviting our, our students and their families to come back and join us back in the district again. Um, we're also opening up our doors to out of district transfers, and we are seeing some success there as well. And then the last piece uh, that we're really, really excited about is, is pushing our pre-K, uh, our, our pre-K um, enrollment um, and, and opening up some pre-K for even younger students next year at, at some specific campuses, which we're, we're confident will help us down the line to continue to grow that enrollment in those areas. Yeah, if I may, uh, thanks, Eddie. That's a good point. So yes, our as of last week, our numbers, I think, were at 46,928. So it's actually our, our enrollment numbers are trending upwards. Um, but again, I mean, uh, from um, Dennis is our CFO, he's always going to be very conservative when it comes to projecting and planning because we definitely want to make sure that um, uh, we don't end up where we end up with a deficit budget. So that's why, but as of last week, we were at 46,928, which is higher than this, this snapshot happened back in last Friday, the month of October of last year. So it's looking good. Can we go one slide back, Eddie? Also, I want to just highlight another thing also. Sure. The last slide uh, for our, uh, for our staff and community to know, like, so um, just to be clear, I know Dennis is going through this uh, a quick because we also have make sure that we have enough time to answer all, all your questions. But this is this is the total MNO tax, which is the, the fifth column. That's really what it takes to to maintain and operate the build to, to our campuses, right? In our district, right? And the INS, the next one is more about that's that's kind of like the money that we borrowed bond money that we borrowed, right? And we have to pay that back because of all the construction and things like that we've been doing. But it's important to highlight that, that again, we are the lowest tax, we have the lowest tax rate for the MNO. So we are trying as we as a district, not all of us, including our board, is trying to make sure that we are very efficient with uh, with getting things done. So we are staying competitive. We are trying to make sure that we offer all these great opportunities for our students and staff. At the same time, we are actually putting uh, one the lowest uh, MNO tax rate for our um, for our for our uh, for our uh, taxpayers. So it's important to note that I know, like Dennis is saying, I mean, we don't control, unfortunately, the, the appraisal uh, values of the homes and the properties here. That's done uh, by obviously by the Williamson County, Travis County appraisal districts. However. You know, for us, what we can do is is try to lower the taxes as much as we can. Obviously, our board has to approve that every year in the month of September, and you can you can see that that's it's really the lowest that we have, and we still are offering all these great opportunities and all this uh, 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 support for our for our students and for our staff. So, just make sure we highlight in that. So, thank you. Thank you, sir. Next one, Eddie. The major portion of, of any school district's budget is staff. And as you can see from this chart, we are comparing our expenses minus recapture and our compensation that's budgeted in the adopted budget for each year. And as you can see, around 88.98% of the 22-23 budget is for staff and compensation. Of that, 75 to 78% of that is at the school level. Since 22, 20, 21, 22, and 22, 23, our total expense budget has gone down by $9 million, but our employee compensation has only gone down by $6 million. So one reduced by 2%, the other one reduced by 1.63%. And just to, just to add on to that, um, so last year we we made a, a very significant um, compensation increase for all positions across our district um, we moved our hourly uh, minimum rate from twelve dollars to fifteen dollars per hour and we moved our starting teacher salary from fifty thousand two hundred and fifty dollars to fifty three thousand dollars and so our board was uh, approved a, a compensation 
a package that included increases of almost $19 million this past school year. So as is, that that's reflected in those numbers, you can see the significant investment by the board um, really kind of helped us move the needle and stay competitive. Uh, and so I just wanted to point that out. A major factor in creating the budget for next year is the ESSA funding cliff. As you all recall that the federal government issued funding to, uh, for schools or ESSA one, two, and three. Our ESSA three uh, dollars, about 28 million that the district received was broken up to spend in two years. And of that $9.6 million are for positions that was currently on staff that we moved to ESSA funding that we have to move back to our general operating budget. And those positions, as you see, are listed there on the left to the tune of $9.6 million, including the cost for summer school. The last line on the chart shows that we had an additional about 80 positions for a total of $3 million that was also funded with ESSER. And those positions, we are bringing those positions back into the budget also. Now let's look at the FY22-24, 23-24 budget scenarios. I'm gonna show you three different scenarios with enrollment, one being flat, one with a decrease of 188 kids as uh, stated by our dem demographer and uh, also a decrease of 300 kids. In building the budget, you also have to consider our ADA. We will be budgeting at an ADA average daily attendance of 94%. Uh, we are capping the property values increase at 10% and our basis allotment at the time that we've done the projection was at $300. And I can tell you right now, there's a bill on the house floor where they're only increasing the allotment by $90. So this, this budget scenario uh, is updated uh, for when we had the numbers prior to the house uh, releasing their budget. So just look a little busy. So let me tell you the three columns. Uh, the column on the left is this year's adopted budget. The next column is, um, 46680 is in uh, enrollment stays flat. And then we have a loss of 188 kids at 46492 and the loss of the 300 kids at 46380. As you can see, the numbers change slightly. We're projecting with, with the tax rate of 7603, which is this maximum compressed rate of 7103 plus the five golden pennies at your current tax collection will be about $475 million. As you can see, those other categories on the left, we won't speak to all of them, but the major ones is your investment income. Uh, with the interest rates climbing set by the federal government, uh, we're projecting a $4 million, uh, $4 million income for investments. Uh, other local income, we see that it may decrease. And our state revenue stays flat around $21.9 million. And for our total revenue projected for next year is $543,337,000. So what are our expenses? When you start building the budget, you have to start with last year's adopted budget. As you can see, the 445-453, last year's adopted budget minus recapture. And then you determine what's going into next year's budget. If you remember from a previous chart, we have $9.6 million in extra funding of positions that we need to bring back into the budget because they was moved as current positions that was moved to ESSA. We have a health insurance premium increase that the board graciously approved an appropriation out of fund balance for $3 million last year to, to stem the growth in our health insurance premiums. Um, property insurance is going up have an update from when we uh, had this meeting before that uh, property insurance premium is going to be about $1.6 million increase, still of $400,000. As you all know, the four fuel prices are going up. Uh, we have a CTE spend requirement of a million dollars. At the time of this presentation, we had an instructional material technology short shortage of a million dollars, but through um, updates from legislature, we are now being told that that will no longer be needed for a million dollars. Also, you see compensation increase at the bottom, about 8,565,000. 
one one percent increase is approximately four million dollars. So that represents about a two percent increase in salaries. Um, as you all know, two percent is is not where we want to be. And so basically, with those expenses, with those uh, student enrollment numbers, we see a recapture bill to the state. Remember that recapture is where you take from the wealthy, give to the poor, the Robin Hood. We have a eight from eighty four million. If we remain flat. The 85 million if we lose 188 kids, the 85 million eight if we lose 300 kids. So our total expenses is 553, 554, and 555. So what does that look like in total? Surplus deficit. I'll call your attention to the red line. At flat fund at flat enrollment, we are $10 million over budget. $11 million if we lose 188 kids, 12.2 million if we lose 300 kids. So how do we balance the budget to get that back to zero? This is a list of things that you can do or we can hope for that could help us uh, reduce our deficit. First, we hope that the legislature will increase their basic allotment. Uh, we, we need everyone to contact your, your legislators and help us to push this uh, increase into the uh, legislature. I think comptroller could increase the maximum compress rate. As I said before, when we done the presentation, it's at 71, and now we've heard and talked that it may be 74 cents. Then we add the five cent code and pennies, and we'll go to 79. Uh, we could project a higher enrollment or a higher ADA, but uh, you should build your budget being conservative, and so, those enrollments that we've seen, even though right now we are project our student enrollment is higher than what, what the budget is built upon, but we have to be a little conservative when we're building the budget. Another way to balance the budget is to go into your current adopted budget and find cuts and reductions. That way you will lower the amount of expenses that you expect, which will lower the amount of your deficit. We could increase the tax rate, as I said before, Currently, the projected tax rate would be the 71 cent plus the five pennies or whatever the uh, state comptroller sets to maximum compressed rate plus five cent. And I would like to say that each golden penny that we have would generate six million and all golden pennies are not subject to recapture. So those six total six million will stay in the district. The other way to balance the budget is for the board to agree to appropriate fund balance. As of June 30th, 2022, our fund balance was $170 million. Here's a little information on fund balance. The fund balance is the value of assets that remain after you pay all your bills. It should be only used for one-time expenditures. It should never be used to cover salaries. These type of expenses include any type of emergencies, employee stipends and bonuses, small capital projects, furniture and equipment, including musical instruments. In instruments. Also, the district board adopted a fiscal and budgetary strategy that requires a minimum of unassigned fund balance of 25% of the budgeted operating expenses. If you see on the right, a little spreadsheet that shows what our fund balance was as of 630, 170 million. Assigned and committed means that we have either purchase orders or projects on the books that eats up to 26 million when available to spend of 144 million. 25 cent restricted comes to 117 million. That's for informational purposes. Okay, so thank you, Dennis. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about compensation and just in general, we talked a little bit earlier about how 89% of our uh, expenditures is in payroll. 80, 80, sorry, 89% of our budget is, is really tied up in that payroll function. And this is a very, um, it's a very snapshot uh, version of a table, right? So this was pulled at a certain time of the year and it reflects the total number of staff that we have now. Staff is headcount of individuals. Of course, not everybody who works in our district is a full-time 1.0, what we call a full-time equivalent. So we have some part-time staff, some staff who work less than 50%, like our crossing guards and lunchroom monitors and things. But this just relates to the total number of people that are actually employed in this district at a certain point in time. And so you can see that 67 
6,010 number, 6,710 number at the bottom. The actual number of full-time equivalents is probably closer to 6,400 at this point. So it's a little bit lower, but that's because of our part-time staff and, and staff who don't make up that, that full-time uh, schedule uh, each week. So you can see the breakout of, um, of how that, that a total compensation, uh, that total salary amount of 333 million and change is broken out and where that's distributed. And so there's a lot of information on that chart, but needless to say, we have a lot of uh, different types of position in our district and we try to categorize those along the lines of, um, you know, our big groups, which are our teachers and librarians, and then our instructional exam, which would be principals, counselors, diagnosticians, SLPs, et cetera. Then you, you get into some other subgroups like our business exempt. And so those would be uh, folks at central office who are managing and, and leading and directing programs. Uh, so like Dennis, myself would be in that group. You would have some directors um, and managers of, of big, big functions like uh, our payroll director would be included in that group and our HR directors would be in there also. And then you get into our technology group. And obviously we know uh, coming, particularly coming out of the pandemic, pandemic, how critical those technology positions have, have really really become in a, in a school district, but also then the challenges of making sure that those positions are paid competitively so we can continue to recruit and retain uh, those folks as well. Um, so then we get into our administrative support. And so that's that's a blend of both central positions, central office positions, but mostly campus support positions that help support your front offices in your in your buildings and in our central office buildings as well. Then we in our instructional support. Um, so you're talking about your teaching assistants, um, uh, your your special ed teaching assistants, and then um, licensed vocational nurses in our in our health clinics. Then our operations support. So this is a very large group um, that is made up of custodians, bus drivers, our maintenance workers, and child nutrition workers. And then lastly, we have a, a separate category for our police group. So like our technology group, that's a very niche type uh, employee grouping in a school district. So we break them out separately so we can compare their salaries across uh across the market, which may be other school districts for those positions, but then also muni municipalities, et cetera. Dr. Easy? Eddie, yeah, and, and thank you, Eddie. And so one good observation, I think, for our, our uh, community here and our staff who are watching is, is really to pay attention to the cost, the percentage of cost total. And you can see that 59%, almost 60% is, is really our teachers and librarian. And then the next biggest one is really our principals, counselors, diagnostician, and um, uh, psycho psychologists, right? Those, those work directly, uh, obviously, with our students. So those most of those positions are, as you know, these are campus-based position. And then the third largest one is our custodian maintenance, bus drivers, our nurses. Um, so those also, um, whether they work also directly, as you know, with you know, with our with our students, so they support the students. And then the last, the third group is our classroom aid. I'm sorry, LVNs and special education aid. So when you take that in consideration you see that the big, big majority percentage of our, what uh, the payroll is really are for our staff who work in directly or somehow directly with our student, which is that's how it's supposed to be. But I just want to make sure that we make that observation because that's how it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be putting more, most of our um, uh, payroll toward folks who are working directly and do, making an impact with our students on a daily basis. Thank you, sir. And so um, the, the amount, the cost that's actually identified here is just the cost of the salary. Uh, Dennis mentioned earlier our health insurance. This does not account for uh, the other types of costs that are associated with somebody's pay. So the district contributes um, for everybody who takes health insurance through the school district. The district contributes $466 per employee per month as well. So that's not factored into these, these numbers that are shown, but that's a pretty sizable number, obviously. In addition, we we have our um, our TRS costs, which the district also pays. So, so the number for the actual payroll cost is a little higher than the number that's reflected in here. So I wanted to explain that, that difference for you. And this is just a visual breakout of what that looks like. Um, as Dr. AZ mentioned, you know, a lot of those positions 
you know, are really campus focused. And so when you look at these pay categories, you know, we as a district with having so many different positions, we have to try to group them in similar type positions, which is why we have these labels like business exempt, operations support, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is that there's lots of different types of positions within each of those pay structures. It's just not possible for us to maintain 50 or 60 different pay structures per se. So that's how it's reflected uh, for, for you visually on this chart. All right. What I wanted to kind of point out here was um, this was um, a market chart that we pulled from 2021, uh, uh, 22. And so I mentioned earlier the significant investment that our board approved for compensation last year, which was almost $19 million. And so there was a big, uh, big reason for that. And, and, and part of the reason was, you know, we, we really, um, we really, determined last year with our board support that we really needed to focus on on our beginning year teachers and, and our teacher salary schedule in general. I mean, you can see the blue line is a local uh, market comparison. Um, that's the median of uh, compensation based on the years of experience for teachers on that pay scale across local districts. So we compare ourselves to districts in the central Texas area and, and try to make sure that we align with, with market pay for pay uh, for people with the same level of experience in those pay groups. So you can see, you know, right around the middle of the pay structure for 10 years and 15 years, Round Rock was very competitive to market um, in those areas. We were higher than the market median. But in the beginning years, the zero to five year category, particularly, we were we were quite a bit less than the market. And so I mentioned earlier how we were able to move our beginning teacher salary from $50,250 up to $53,000. Um, that was a very intentional move on our part. But you can see that just, just to get to, to get to the, to the market piece, I'll show you a graph in just a minute. It takes a very significant investment in our compensation. And I wanted to show you the why on the next slide. So this is a, a breakout of teacher demographics in terms of the years of experience that we have. So Round Rock ISD has always been very, um, has always prided ourselves on the, on the experience and, and um, really the, uh, the, the amount of experience that our teachers have. You know, we've traditionally had more experienced teachers uh, than some of the surrounding districts, and it's been a point of pride for us. At one point, we sold that we had um, 11, uh, the average years of experience for our teachers was 11.6, and that's about two years, two years ago, that data. But you can see from this graph, the importance of having to make sure that we're competitive in those lower, uh, those lower uh, years of experience ranges as well. The reason being about 31% of our teaching staff is currently has currently less than five years of experience. So if we're going to compete with the local market and our and our peer districts, we need to come out strong and make sure that we have a competitive wage. Uh, the other piece and the other important factor to that is about 7% of our teaching staff have more than 25 years of experience. And so those folks could be approaching uh, retirement um, or, or even be, be, be thinking about those types of decisions. We really hope they aren't yet, but, but that's always a consideration for us as well. And so so when we hire or, or try to hire replacements for folks who decide to to retire and move on, you know the likelihood is, given this data, that um, the the likelihood is we're more more inclined to hire new teachers or teachers with less experience. And so it's really important for us to to make sure that we're competitive in those areas. And so on the next slide. This is our current uh, teacher salary in terms of the market. And you can see how that needle has moved significantly uh, just to get us to market. So even now, uh, the market median is slightly higher, very, very slightly higher than, than where we are. It's about $50 higher in the median. And we're still very competitive in, the, in those middle years, thanks to that significant investment last year. But you can see that even with a significant investment, this just gets us to where we need to be for market. And so one of the things that happened last year was we came out of the gates early and we, uh, thanks to our board, we were able to come out and, and make a pretty aggressive uh, uh, compensation increase. And then we were able to start marketing that. And, and, and what happened following that was every other district followed suit. And so that's what caused that market to increase the way that it has. And so all that to be said that every year that we try to get more and more competitive, it does take a significant amount of money to get there. And every other district is feeling that same pressure to try and get that to market because every one of them wants to make sure they're competitive in those areas. I just want to add uh, to our listeners that that obviously the team um, worked really hard to make it make this a possibility, obviously, and we're very thankful to our board for approving it. But but uh, the school district, like in the surrounding school district, they had to really work really, really hard to keep up with us. 
And I don't know if, if uh, some of you are familiar what happened in, in Serrano, some of our Serrano school district, but they have to actually go for what's called a TRE, which is asking their voters to approve more golden pennies or more, uh, what you call it, copper uh, pennies. And, and with golden pennies, is really the it's it's money it's it's that six million dollars per penny for example for us it's not subject to recapture in other words uh, if we collect the the six million dollars for for that golden penny and our district will keep the entire six million dollars we can we don't have to send anything back to the state it's not part of the recapture the eighty five or possibly hundred million dollars that we have to but some of our surrounding school district have to go all the way that and go to their voters and ask him for like two or three, whatever pennies, so they can keep up with our district, whereas our district, um, uh, because of all the, the hard work, as I said, everyone working together, we're able to make this happen without really the need of going out uh, and asking our voters for increasing uh, or approving any, any TRE, I guess, uh, with extra golden pennies. So again, um, yeah, we put on, we put the Australian school district in a very bad situation that they have to kind of approve the, the compensation and asking the, the voters for that. So I just want to make sure that our community knows or our listeners know know exactly what happened last year. Thank you, Dr. AZ. So just, just to, before I finish on this slide, um, just to, to kind of refresh us on, on what happened last year the, and the percentages involved, just before we get to the next slide, the teacher salary increase last year was a minimum of 5% general pay increase. So, so that's just a relative term, which will make more sense when I show you the next slide. Okay. So it was a 5% increase. So we've, we've been working with our, um, our vendor, which is the Texas Association of School Boards. I'm trying to trying to figure out how do we forecast what it would cost to do various different models for next year. I mean, if we were able to secure more funding, um, this number would would look a little higher, I would assume. But Dennis mentioned earlier 2% and he put an $8.6 million figure up there. Well, this is how that's broken out. And again, this is based on a, on a snapshot of time in terms of the number of employees who are actually uh, on board at that point in time. But you can see that uh, just to, for a 2% model um, in, in each of those different pay categories that we referenced earlier, these are the associated costs that would get us to the 8.6. Um, the, the adjustments column, just to explain that, is every time you make a general pay increase, there's a little bit of uh, adjustments that you have to make within the overall pay structures. As I mentioned earlier, we have, you know, almost, I think we're at 6,400 employees and multiple, uh, you know, multiple different position types and pay structures within those positions. And so when you make one move, like for example, we we increased our teacher pay rate by 5%. Well, the, the positions that are um, at the campus that maybe that that teacher reports to, we have to adjust those. And while we didn't necessarily move those by 5%, we have to ensure that there's enough of a, of a, of a promotional opportunity for anybody moving from a teacher to a counselor position or a teacher to an assistant principal position, et cetera, that that's what those adjustments are. So they just allow us to really balance those pay structures and make sure that over time they don't compress to the point where a teacher who wants to move into a, a position, like a, a, an instructional coach position or an assistant pr principal position, uh, they're actually making, they're actually getting a promotion that comes along with a salary increase. And so that's what those adjustments do. Um, and, and I wanted to speak to that. So there was no confusion on what those were. So we we brought these to a board to our board at a workshop on March the thirtieth, and and this was uh, Dennis mentioned earlier some new realities that I think we've we've uh, we are, are new the new norms that are coming out of our legislature. But uh, I wanted to put out some some additional cost information for what it would look like. So you'll recall last year, I, I mentioned earlier we did a five percent increase for teachers. Uh, 4% and 3% for different other employee groups. But just to give you that point of reference for 5% for teachers, if we were to say, if the, if we had the revenue to do it and the, and the funding to do it, just a 5% model would be almost $20 million. And so um, it's a pretty significant investment when you mentioned, you know, I refer back to last year when we did nine, almost $19 million in pay increases. So that's just a relative term. So, um, that's really all I have. I'm going to turn that back to Dennis and he can talk about the calendar. Dennis, you're muted, sir. Right after the Thanksgiving break, I start trying to look at preliminary numbers so we can present it to the board on that March 9th date. 
We also, as Eddie said, we had TASB to come in and do a compensation analysis presentation to the board on March 30th. So coming up on May 4th, we will be presenting an update to the uh, board on our m and budget and also our other two budgets, our RNS and our child nutrition budget on May 4th. On that board meeting on May 18th, we'll be providing additional information as it comes out of the legislature and updating the board on what we know then. And on June 1st, the superintendent will plan to present his budget for success to the board on June 1. And on June 20th, we need to hold a budget adoption at the regular board meeting. Then come September 21, the board at the regular board meeting, we will approve the tax roll and tax rates for the next year. So we always ask, you all ask, what can you do to support our budget and our process to get more funding for public education and for Round Rock ISD? You can contact your legislators. Share your concerns about our current system, in particular, either the basic allotment, the recapture, things that you are concerned with that affect public school funding. You need to advocate for public education funding. And Last but not least, stay engaged during the legislative sessions. And now I'll turn it back over to Maritza. Maritza, can I say a few things before uh, we open it up for questions, please? Um, I know, I know, because I've been asked a lot of questions, you know, from parents and stuff like that, and community members asking what we can now do, and um, and and you know. And it's 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 a valid question, right? It's also like, what do you mean? Like we're paying more taxes, and I know our taxpayers are paying more taxes despite us lowering the tax rate. I know because of the property values have been going up year after year, right? But like Dennis uh, was saying earlier, with with the exception of really the golden pennies, I mean, we are subject to the rest is subject to recapture, meaning more taxes doesn't mean like the state. I mean, sorry, the district, uh, um, you know, is keeping. Uh, that money here you know oh, oh, we 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 are obligated to send a recapture money to to the state and uh we i think uh, i think um uh, when the recapture start back in the 1990s i think there were a handful of school districts who are recapture district and since then now we're talking about a couple of hundreds who are recaptured district who are sending money back to the state and used to be where about 25 or 30 million dollars were sent back to the state. And now we're talking about billions of dollars are sent back to the state as the form of free capture. So, um, you know, and there's a historic historic surplus in our in our state and um, and our legislators now they're looking at the budgets for the next you know couple of years. And I, I know it's important, very important to give a tax break and, and take care of many other projects that they have in mind. But I think it's important also to understand that you know, with inflation that went up almost by 14% uh, from 2019 to now, and all everything has been going up uh, to, to operate and run a school district and compensation, we have to make sure that our teachers and staff are being compensated, you know, uh, and getting what they deserve and more, plus the inflation, right, that is costing them really to, to pay more uh, uh, for everything. So it's important for our state uh, legislators to understand um, that they have to look at that. The basic allocation did not go up since 2019. It's still 6,160. And like Dennis was saying, one of the plan is talking about increase by 90 students per student, which is the, our own Texas controller talked about just to um, account for the inflation since 2019. That number should be $900 per student increase, not 90, but 900. And that's something that our... Own Texas, um, you know, controllers said uh, that just to to compensate. So, so again, I mean, we are advocating for our students, and I know a lot of our parents and community members want to do the same thing. So, we want to, as much as possible, explain, um, you know, what's happening, and um, and it's happening across the state. It's not just happening uh, in Round Rock ISD. It's happening across the state. Plus, as you know, there is the SR three funds cliff. Uh, school district were given some extra federal money back in, in spring of 2021. Some school district decided to spend it over two years. Some decided to spend it over three years. And that cliff is coming. Um, so, and those are, 
uh, some school district decided to have uh, folks um, or and staff members funded through that. And so that money is going away, right? So school district now, they are struggling to figure out how to kind of continue paying for staff members um, because obviously they don't want to, uh, the need is still there, right? And so I just, again, we want to make sure that we're given as much information as possible uh, to our staff and to our community members. So thank you, Dr. Aziz, for chiming. And thank you, Dennis and Eddie, for providing that contextual and just information overall about the budget. Um, so that concludes our presentation for the evening. So we're going to go ahead and get started with our Q&A portion of the night. Um, as a reminder, if you see the Q&A section or the Q&A feature down, down there, you're more than welcome to submit a question um, to where we can answer. We do have some questions from today. We also have some other that were submitted previously. And we'll go ahead and get started. I know a lot about recapture was, was mentioned. And our first question is, what percentage of is recapture um, are over of the, oh, excuse me, let me rephrase this. What percentage is recapture of the overall ISD budget? Hold on, let me see if I can calculate that right quick. It's around 20% um, of what we, we collect. Uh, it's about 20%, it's maybe a little less than 20%, but that number is going up year after year, but as of this year, we're estimating it will be around 20%, maybe a little less than 20% that we have to send back to the state from what we collect. And so this 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 question follows in that sentiment, falls within that theme. Will part of the hundred or the part of the, I think it was 85 million that we're sending for recapture, um, will that go to school, school choice vouch vouchers if passed by the legislator? Well, when, when the state um, brings in the recapture, it goes into the general fund. So those funds are can be used as the state legislature sees fit. So I can't say that it goes to uh, vouchers, but it just goes into the general fund and it could be used for vouchers. Thank you. And I know we talked a lot golden pennies and I think there might be, it still needs a little bit of clarity as far as um, what what they are. So can you go into debt or explain again, um, what, what is a golden penny? The golden penny is, is a, um, probably the tax rate that as from the previous slide, you saw that where the state sets the maximum compressed rate. And then our board has elected that we can have five golden pennies, which means a five cent, uh, tax added on to the taxes. And that is multiplied for your property. And as you can say, a golden pen is about $6 million. And of that $6 million, none of it is subject to recapture. So all tax dollars um, derived from the golden pen stay here in Round Rock ISD. Um, what is the difference between a golden penny and a copper penny? A copper penny, uh, you can have up to nine copper pennies, but copper pennies are subject to recapture. On average, uh, for each... Um, copper penny, 40, about 40% will stay in the district, 60% uh, will go to the state as subject to recapture. Let me, let, can I add something to that? Um, so, so the way it works is usually you have to go for your all, for your golden pennies first, right? So the first five golden pennies are, all golden pennies are not subject to recapture. So the first five requires board approval, up to five. Anything beyond, which is up to three more, it's 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 also no subject to recapture. You get to keep all that money, and that's we have to go to the voters. And I think that's what Leander, for example, did. Uh, that's what Flugerville did. I think Haro did the same thing. All of them have all these extra pennies, right? That uh, they're uh, they were they were added to the, uh, their tax rate. Then after you 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 consume all the eight golden pennies, then the next thing is up. Like Dennis was saying, you get access to up to nine copper pennies and those also have to go out for voters approval the only thing unlike the golden penny that you can keep all 100 percent of them uh no subject to recapture only 40 percent you get to keep the other 60 percent will be subject to recapture does that make sense so and some of our our surrounding school district actually already using some of those co uh, copper pennies as already and they're probably uh trying to kind of maximize that as much as possible and the reason they do it again is because they allow them to keep some of that money in the, with them so they can spend it as, as they need to spend it right in their district. And so I think you may have answered the next question within your response, but just so we're clear, 
how how can we get more golden pennies? So as I said, the first five, uh, the, uh, the uh, requires board approval. There's, then you have three more, which is maximum of eight. So the next three, you can go up for one or two or three. They requires board approval first. Then you have to go to the voters and ask them, hey, would you approve, uh, please, you know, you know, an increase, you know, one golden penny or two or three. So uh, that, that's what require voters approval. Thank you, Dr. Easy. Um, So the next question, we're going back to recapture. Who is responsible for the state's recapture surplus distribution? So really, it's, it's really it's up to uh, um, TEA. Really, is is uh, working with the controller, uh, Texas, uh, the controllers, uh, Texas controller's office. I think they work together on that. But uh, we we really they do all the calculation. There's not a set formula out there for us to use. We try to figure it out, but it's a lot of it is guessing. And that number, like Dennis was saying, is is just changed from one year, one one time, one month to another. Sometimes. Gotcha. So we're going back to school choice and vouchers. And then our next question, it's if vouchers are approved, how does that impact the district? Does it impact our budget? Well, well, the money has to come from somewhere, right? And so if the state decides to fund vouchers, that money has to come from somewhere. And oftentimes it's going to come from any money that the state has. And a lot of that money, if you know, it's part of that money, I'm sorry, is coming from recapture, Right. Um, and, and part of it is probably from other funding, uh, sources. So it has to come from somewhere. Yes. And it will, one way or another will impact funding for school districts or we'll reduce the amount of money maybe is available for school district to have. Dr. AZ, just last, last time they did a, uh, in house bill three, we used to have a different alliance. This is just a version of that, where we had something called the high school allotment. And I remember with the high school allotment that went away, but they wrapped that into the overall basic allotment increase. Right. So, so it, is it fair to say that they may, they may look at something like that? I mean, b- based on that experience where they may, some of those different funding sources change, right? Yeah, it's it's just very hard to predict right now because there are different bills out there, um, and um, yeah, it's very hard. I mean, I, I've seen different numbers, uh, different estimate estimation, if you will, right? How much will cost the state to have uh, vouchers, for example, right? So it's it just really very hard to tell right now. But I'm I'm thinking it was going to impact funding. Um, yeah. Thank you. And so the, this next question really goes back to the, the budget development the scenarios are, are developed and how projections are, are developed as well. So are projections based on projected enrollment numbers or current enrollment numbers? If they are not based on projected, why not? They are based on projected. Our demographer has, we have a demographer that we bring in every year that comes in and look at our graduating class, our incoming class, birth rates. And he gave us a number. And as I say, the demographer has projected our enrollment would decline by 188 students. And as I said earlier, I mean, obviously the demographer is just, it's its also, he's doing, he's doing his best to project, right? So, but from a dentist point, as I said, if he doesn't, he doesn't um, build his budget conservatively, we may end up in, in, in a deficit budget in the year. So that's why Dennis has to really, build it like conservatively right um but every indicator i mean as i said you know uh it's looking like we're gonna see you know uh it might be a slight but uh you know an increase in our enrollment right so again I, obviously i'm we're all predicting right i mean I, I mean but that's what's looking right so again it's we are all projecting here and is there a scenario um, that is likely where, where enrollment increases? I know we're doing different things to bring students back into our, our campuses as well, but is, is that a, a likely scenario that we could see even more students coming back? Well, I, I can tell you, we are just last, as of last week, we were looking at the enrollment number, like April, around April 20th of last year versus April 20th of this year. And we there is, a, there is actually an increase in enrollment by about 80 to 100 kids, students just from last year to this year at this time. So, so again, we, we are very optimistic um, uh, about this and um, we are working very hard to recapture our students uh, who may be left to go to private schools or charter schools or home, um, 
uh, or uh, you know homeschooled and things like that. So we are really trying to work with them. We also have some schools who may have uh, some more um, uh, some uh, space available. We allow in our principals obviously uh, to take a look at any of out of school district transfers that parents want to come. Obviously, we have we are a great district. And some parents want to come here, but obviously we're always going to take care of our own Rock ISD students first. But then if there is a space, there is always a chance um, again, because that that's our our um, our budget or our the way we're funded by TEA. As I said, it's based on the number of students times the attendance, the average daily attendance times the 6,160, which is the basic allotment, right? So more students. It's more funds for our student, for our students, and for our staff, for our district to be able to uh, to use, right? To to help with a variety of things, including compensation and support. And so this kind of goes back to what we were just talking about: open enrollment. Is if Brown Rock ASD has open enrollment and out of district kids come to our schools, how is the budget for the individual school affected? Does the budget increase? Definitely, definitely the, uh, the allocation, teachers allocation, you know, it will be impacted. For example, you know, we, we use a formula, right, to, to, uh, to allocate te teachers to, uh, to campuses. And so if that number goes up, obviously that will also increase the staff that will be allocated to them um, based on the formula, right? But also, uh, it's also will impact also the, the amount of money they will get um, um, to spend, right? Um, and Eddie, I don't know if you want to, expand on that yes sir yeah it's just like you, you said and based on the number of students that that a campus has um that's generally how a lot of our positions are allocated and so um the number of students that um that a campus has at that at that particular grade level for example if it's an elementary school or um or just more generally if it's in a secondary campus can in, impact directly the number of staff that they have but then also you know, the, the, and this is more in Dennis's world, so I, I hope I'm saying this right, but, you know, for the number of the number of students that they have also determines the amount of funding they receive for other activities like uh, tutoring and things like that. So, so it's definitely a big impact on making sure that we get those students. So our next question, still on that same, does the budget increase in time for the school to prepare for new out of district students? Yeah, because... Go ahead, go ahead, Dennis. Well, when we adopt the budget in June, um, we have to adopt it based on the count of students that we have now at that time. But if there are more students that come in that may change the allocation needed out of school, those dollars will uh, flow to the school for additional positions because our recapture number would go down because we got more students and that would leave more dollars in the district. Dr. Azi, I know that you got, uh, did you have anything else to add, Dr. Azi? I, I was, I, I just wanted to add this. It obviously for every student uh, we get is, is again, it's, uh, it's the basic allotment, 6,160 times that daily attendance for that particular student, right? So like Dennis is saying, that money uh, will be given to the district, but then obviously that money or the majority, as we, we talked about, that is, is going uh, to the campuses, uh, going through uh, allo allocation, like staff allocation or uh, support and uh, et cetera, right? So yes, if the numbers go up, obviously we'll, we'll adjust to make sure that our classrooms are uh, size are, are the way we, we want it to be. We don't want those classes to, to be over um, like crowded. Um, you know, in the, in the past, especially beginning of this year and, and part of this year in certain campuses, we, the, we had some classes. We had we had some um, classes where they were large, not because we didn't want to hire more teachers. It's just because we were, it was harder for us to find quality uh, teachers for, in certain areas, for example, to to be in those positions. But now we are working very hard. All every everyone is working very hard to ensure that we are hiring early. We just had our own um, uh, job fair this past Saturday, and we had you know hundreds you know folks uh, sign up and came and uh, our principals and all their staff or a lot of their uh, staff were there interviewing so we're trying to you know uh, have a um like hire early so we can ensure again that our our classrooms are fully um um uh, not only funded but also we have we have staffed 
staffed, right? Fully staffed. Uh, so we can take care of our students next year. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, and so I know we, we've had this question a few times. I know we answered it in there, but I think it's important that we say it again, um, just, just to make it clear. It's my property values aren't continuing to go up. Why isn't that enough to fund our schools? I think that's what we try. I think that's that's one, and that's a very valid question. Um, the stu, uh, school and district finance is very complex, right? And and it's uh, you know, and it's it's you know, it took me years for me to understand it myself, right? And I'm I'm I, that's what I you know that's what I do. We all work you know directly with with uh, with district and campuses. It, it just it just because we are collecting more taxes, meaning that we have to keep it. Um, as I said, you know, school was district the way they get funded is through a, a, a formula that is set by the state, which is again, the number of students you have times, what is your uh, average daily attendance, which is like the percentage of, you know, the percentage of attendance, right? Like in five, 95% of the students attend on a daily basis, whatever the, for example, and then time is, is what's called a basic allotment that is set by the state. Uh, and that was set back in 2019 and it's 6,160. So if we collect more money, we send uh, uh, more money that what we're supposed to have based on that formula, then we send it to the state. And that's called recapture. There are school districts who do not collect enough taxes based on that, that formula. So what happened is the state send them money, right? So in our case, the state we send money to the state. In other school districts, there may be a situation where the state is sending them money to compensate for, for, um, for that lack of uh, taxpayers, uh, tax, uh, tax money, right? Uh, collected by the, by that particular district. So, um, uh, uh, and I'm, yeah, I'm, and I'm, I know, and it's frustrating for our, uh, taxpayers here, uh, particularly on our district, but we, like was, was Dennis is saying, um, we're, we're thinking anywhere between 85 to a hundred million dollars from our own local taxpayers money will be sent this year alone. Uh, to the state, um, and that we don't, we we can't keep it. We cannot keep it. Um. So so thank you for clearing for clearing that up. And so this kind of goes along with that question, talking about tax rates and how that works. And why is Austin ISD's INS rate so much lower? Yeah, that's a good question. So INS uh, Austin ISD, I don't think so. Our district, Roanoke ISD, for the past I don't know twenty years has been a, a what's called a fast growing district. Um, and we had a lot of, uh, obviously, families and moved in here. And then uh, the school district, our district, uh, had to build a lot of new uh, campuses, right? Um, and so in order to build those campuses, the district had to uh, borrow money, bond money to be able to do it. And unlike Austin ISD, I don't think, I don't think the, they are, were able to have a lot of new campuses. I think now they are going for a big bond of like, I think, over $2 billion dollars. But uh, because we are uh, a district, as I said, it was a fast growing district, our district for the last, as I said, 20 years or so, been borrowing money to build the new buildings. And so and so the INS is really paying those bonds back or those loans back. Right. Um, because they use that money. And and so, yes, we're not we're we're higher than Austin because Austin, I don't think they were a fast growing district uh, for the past 10, 20 years. And I don't think they build a lot of new campuses like we did here in Round Rock ISD. So therefore their loans, their loans are, are a lot smaller. And can I add to that, Mother, that by law, you must set a, an INS tax rate that covers the principal and interest for the payments for that year. So we, we can't lower that tax rate beyond what it would generate to pay the premium and the interest that's due for that tax year. So our next question, we're just kind of going to the budget developing process and how how can decisions are made, how what factors are considered. Um, so what so how how do we determine what, what kind of budget adjustments are going to be made? A lot of that is is looking at cost efficiencies, cost savings, uh, things that that um, you can do to either increase your budget that's, that's needed or things that you can possibly reduce in your budget to help fund the things that you need in the budget. It all flows into an in and out process where the staff evaluates the needs of the district or the, the school schoolhouses and central offices and facilities. And it, it, it all comes together into this big pie. 
the pie is not getting bigger. So you have to control the slices within the pie. And when we're making those decisions, what what are we doing to ensure that individual campuses with specific needs are being considered in this process? Yes, ma'am. Thanks, Maritza. So we 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 uh, we work with our principal. We are very proud of the fact that every campus is different, right? And and so we yeah, every one of them is unique, and every one of them has unique needs. Just like every kid has unique needs, our, our campuses are that way too. So one of the things that I I really love about our district is that there is a real effort to try to you know figure out some creative solutions to to difficult problems, and sometimes that's. Um, you know, using FTEs in a different way, you're using, you know, using positions in a different way to support different programs. But sometimes it's maybe using the funding that we have at our campus in a different way also to help support. So an example might be tutoring. Um, so we, we have something called House Bill 4545. And so that's, that's a, uh, th- there's, there's ways to, to accomplish the, the extra tutoring that's required there that could be either hiring tutors and using funds to actually pay those tutors after hours or actually asking our teachers to, to 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 pick up that lift as well. And again, it just speaks to the flexibility that we try to we try to create for our principals to work through those problems. The challenges are just obviously we have to kind of manage it within the same budget, right? But um, but we we try to we try to create those flexibilities so they're not um, so we we don't make things harder for them and and try to create some some agile systems to help with that. Hey, thank you. Um, so I know we talked about like flexibility and staffing, and this question just is related to staffing. It's specifically about retention, and it's what incentives are we offering to be able to keep our staff and to incentivize them staying with us? Like, I, I know we had we had a few questions asking, like, can we incentivize like certifications? Is what can what can we do? What are we offering? Yeah, because, if I, go ahead, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, please go ahead, sir. Thank you. Uh, uh, so I can I can speak to at least what we've done this year. For example, besides what Eddie talked about, is almost twenty million dollars that our board approved uh, for um, increasing compensation. That's 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 actually adding to the to the salary right of our teachers and staff, which is um, part of like it will be count toward their TRS, which is the teacher retirement system. We our our I'm proud to say that our board approved almost a, a nine point five million dollar. Uh, retention uh, uh, bonus, retention and recruitment bonus. I think happened in the fall, um, and and uh, that's something on top of that almost twenty million dollars that Eddie talked about. It. So for this year, so obviously we always are trying to be creative and figure out a way. But we're also very blessed to have a board who understands and 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 cares about uh, keeping our great teachers and our great staff here. So those are the the cool things we were doing. But Eddie can talk more about what we've done and what he's done with his team uh, in HR to um, to recruit and retain also, Eddie. Yeah. So on top of that, we've, we've created some different pipelines for employees and try to help support employees through career pathways. So we all, we all have read and, and heard how, um, you know, there is a national teacher shortage. And so um, we, we were not, um, we were not, Like me, Eddie, maybe. I think we lost Eddie. I think we may lost Come Eddie. Our oh, I'm we back. lost you, Eddie. I'm okay, back. Sorry. So, I was uh, talking to myself for a minute. Sorry about that. Just so, a little bit. So, Eddie, we'll go ahead and if you could just recap the the answer, yeah. the response, um, as far as like the some of the efforts, I think that that's where we lost you. Sure. Yes, ma'am. Um, I, it was my best work too, but no, we, um, we were, I was talking a little bit about some of the programs that we've had to put in place just to respond to our national teacher shortage. And, you know, in Round Rock, we've, we haven't, you know, obviously been excluded from that. And so we've had to really kind of think outside the box in terms of how do we support um, other pipelines for potential teachers in the classrooms. And so one of the things that our board was able to support this year was creating a pathway to help support tuition costs for our paraprofessional employees or teaching assistants to go and pursue their teaching certificate. So our Rock Teach Academy is a 
is a way for us to do that. And, and, and that was, you know, we were actually able to identify some funds to help support those individuals to go get their teaching certificate. And so that's just one example. Another example is we offer a $500 teacher referral bonus um, for any employee in the district who refers a teacher who is hired and stays with us for a minimum of 90 days, they can receive $500. And so that's been a really successful uh, program as well. I mean, nobody knows a good teacher like a good teacher, right? So, so that's the purpose behind that. And we offer that in some other hard to fill type positions as well. We have a, a similar incentive program for our bus drivers and our custodians that, that has really helped fill some of those gaps this year. Um, but we're always thinking outside the box in terms of how we, how can we really create multiple pathways? Um, we've got a really close partnership with uh, Texas State and is one of our uh, university partners, but also UT. And we've had lots of conversations with them about how to, how to increase uh, the number of student teachers who choose Round Rock ISD, um, but then also to create different programs that are called teacher residencies to help support hiring in some of our harder to fill positions. So um, we we never stop in HR trying to be creative and trying to think of ways to help support. Um, the, the good news is that Dr. AZ mentioned we had a really well attended uh, career teacher career event on Saturday. And um, we had almost 100 more candidates attend than compared to last year. So I think I think um, I think our reputation as a district speaks for itself and people do want to come and work in Round Rock ISD. So I feel confident that with the, the multiple approaches that we're taking, that we'll we'll have a, a, a lot more in our tool uh, tool belt to be able to, to tackle staffing challenges this summer. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. And so we're going to go back to just some the some of the potential proposals and, and as far as just navigating that. And so we've had this question a few times this evening. Um, it's our, our library assistants being laid off. Can you explain what is happening with that? Yes, ma'am. So no employee is being laid off. Okay. Every employee will, will retain employment with the district. Um, what we, we actually, um, so our original uh, plan has been adjusted somewhat. And so we went back to the, the drawing board and we were able to come back with a revised proposal for that staffing guideline for those library services. And so it does, we, we have had to tighten our belts a little bit in that area, but we've also ensured that, you know, we'll be able to continue to support some of our kids who, who might need the most support at campuses. Um, so, let, uh, but to be clear, no employee was being laid off in this process. That was something that we were, um, we, it was something that we really wanted to make sure um, was very clear, uh, both in our conversation tonight and also in our communication with employees. As business needs change in school districts, oftentimes the, the things that positions do change also, and the way that we provide services changes also. And so with that being said, you know, for anybody who would uh, necessarily uh, they would while they might retain employment with the district they may be, end up in a different type position and we call that process our surplus process and it's not the that term is not meant to indicate that our employees are not of any way value for us it just means that that position is that you know they they're not lo no longer staffed in that type of position but every employee would be accounted for in a in an equivalent position um either at their campus or at a, at a another campus in the district Thank you. So this this question kind of goes along with that. Just asking the question of potential as far as like staffing. Will the budget impact social workers? Will social workers be cut at any of the schools? I know you said uh, no. It's not. It's not going to happen. I mean, we're not. We're not. We're not planning on. I mean, it's, if anything, I mean, we all understand that the need for uh, even an increase in of need. I guess when it comes to the mental um, and emotional uh, health and need for our students and staff. So. If anything, we want to continue building on that, um, um, increasing it, not not decreasing uh, the support. And and we love our social workers um, and what they have been doing, uh, you know, to help our students getting through very difficult uh, times. And 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 again, that's not that's not even an option that we are discussing. And so I know we we mentioned social workers, but I did have a question on counselors as well. That the same thing. It's the same thing. We're not. We're not. We're not. We're not. It's not even it's not even an option, as I said, like not for our counselors, not not for our social workers. Thank you. Um, and again, we're talking about impacts. We're talking staffing and now we're going to programs. Um, will social uh, excuse me, will special education be impacted by budget adjustments or changes? Not at all. Not at all. Um, as I said, you know, if anything, we want to make sure that we're providing um, our students, especially the ones who need, who need the extra support the most. Uh, with the help that they need and deserve. So 
I mean, obviously, you know, we we we, we want to make sure we they will continue supporting them and supporting their learning and their well-being. And so we had a question again. We're talking about uh, staffing, but this one's just in relation to staffing positions that are unfilled. So. Yeah. The staffing positions that are unfilled, where where is that money going to? Is that money that the district can put aside for something, or how? how where is that? Where are those funds going? So so and and Dennis can talk to it a little bit more. But when he built his budget, we can we can project more or less. We can predict more or less. You know, from year to year, how much money um, how much money the a district a district can save and and like a vacant position or maybe position that would take a I don't know, a month or two to fill, right? Um, and so he was able to to kind of predict that. Obviously, that could be off by a little, right? And then he was able to use that as part of the, his budget when he 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 created and built. Um, and I was approved by all our board members back in June. And that allowed us really to balance the budget and be able to give almost, as I said, the $20 million raise for our teachers and staff. So, all right, Dennis, am I wrong about that, sir? You, you factor that correct, in? Correct, sir. Well said. For someone that's not a finance officer. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And so next is can can we speak to what the status of filling vacant educational assistant positions? Um, I can speak to it in that we're working very hard to to continue to fill those positions, and we continue to 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 work hard to staff them. Um, you know that what we did this year, we Dr. Az mentioned earlier, we uh, we had a a, a dedicated special education uh, incentive that our board funded um, that that allowed us to kind of really focus on those special education teaching assistant positions. Um, we we continue to be challenged with ensuring that we you know, we're, we're able to keep, keep up with inflation because, you know, last year, a lot of the industries in the area, um, they moved that minimum wage up quite a bit, which put a lot of pressure on us from, from those types of positions in order to stay competitive. And so that's, you know, part of the philosophy of trying to ensure that we remain competitive to market comes within that budget. You know, I mean, like Dennis mentioned earlier, the pie and, and, you know, we talk about the pizza sometimes, but the pie is not getting bigger, unfortunately, at the minute by, by enough um, to be able to, to to push those wages where you know we we would like them to go, so we're trying to be as creative as possible to keep moving those up. But I also believe, you know, I, I mentioned our Rock Teach Academy earlier. Um, you know, salaries and compensation are definitely a big part to that. But another part of it is making sure that there's opportunities for people to grow their career with our district. And I think our investment in Rock Teach and being able to compensate or to, to be able to, to pay for the tuition costs that come along with going to pursue your teaching certificate is a great step to, to allowing an employee to be able to, to pursue those higher earnings themselves. And so um, I feel like we're you know, we'll continue to explore that in terms of um, other employee groups and how we can help support them through those career pathways. Because I think we as a district, we have lots and lots of different positions and lots and lots of opportunities for employees to continue to grow with the district. Thank you. And so both of um, you've mentioned wages. And so both of these are connected um, as far as salary compensation. So this first question is, will anyone's salary be cut to help address budget challenges? No, ma'am. A very simple, straightforward answer. I like it. And so this next question is a little bit longer. Um, are the proposed compensation percentage percentage increases that you shared already including SB9 rec the, the SB9 recommendation for teacher statewide annual income increase by two thousand dollars? I don't think it's part of it. Um, we still we st we are. I mean, we would love to have that too, but we are still working on it, and that's one of the reasons why. Um, we usually we typically take uh, our compensation plan end of this month to our board uh, for their approval, and um, um, but that's one of the reasons why we're not doing it this this month, and we're pushing it back to next month because we want to get more information from uh, our legislators because there's a lot of there are a lot of bills out there, and there are a variety of options, and nothing is set in stone. We don't even know what's going to happen. And so if, if that, that $2,000 end up, that's a one, by, by the way, in that bill, I think it's a one-time thing. Um, and it's one year, I think, uh, $2,000 for our teachers. Uh, I mean, we, we, at, this, at this time, we take anything to take care of our teachers, anything extra, obviously, but it's not part of the, our plan. 
And so we're going uh, from, we're kind of bouncing around from uh, WIC to staffing to we're going back to programming and, and resources and, and so we're able to provide our campuses. And so this question is, despite the financial burden that, that we're all facing, but specifically in Round Rock ISD, will we continue to invest in safety? Are our grants something that we can utilize? Yeah. I, I can I can talk to that, and I know I know I know uh, safety and security is never was mine, with, and rightfully so, right? Um, I can tell you that kind of like what we talk about our mental health and our social worker and counselors, etc. I mean, we're gonna we're gonna uh, keep investing in, in our safety and security uh, for make sure that our students and our staff and everyone is safe. Um, and, uh, we we actually have we applied actually in different grants. Um, one of them is almost for $2 million grant with, from the governor's office, and there were others that we are applying to. So I think it was, I saw a question talking about the panic button and things like that, that other school districts are doing. We as a district were ahead of all that stuff. I just want everybody to know we have so many different things that are already either um, done or in the works already. And we really, I feel very comfortable about where we're at uh, and where we're heading. Uh, but we also have, we also have, um, different grants, as I said, that our district applied for, and we're waiting for hopefully for approval so we can uh, do more when it comes to safety and security. Um, and once we get that, we'll, we obviously will be more than happy to share with our community. Um, um, as I said, you know, another thing is also one of our priorities to advocate for safety and security. And I think uh, we would like to see the state invest in more and mental health and also invest in more when it comes to the physical safety of the campuses. So if that happens too, that would give us even, um, you know, help us um, uh, take our safety and security to the next level. And when it, when it comes to the programming and resources that we, that we prioritize when it comes to budget, what, what are those? Like what areas do those encompass? I know safety and security is one. Um, is there anything else that you can add as far as like, is there anything we're focusing on as far as like enrichment or anything like that in this year's budget? Well, well, well you know, the, what we're trying to do is really ensure that our programs are fully funded, right? Uh, I mean, we have like, for example, we have, as you know, we have an amazing fund our programs and then it's not cheap to, to have an amazing uh, program. I, I can talk, I give I can give an example. And um, for example, next door to us, Leander, right? Leander ISD, for example, they don't they don't have an orchestra program whatsoever. They don't, right? They only focus on marching band and they do band all day, right? Whereas here, for example, our district, we do a great job with marching band, but we also offer orchestra. And as you all know, orchestra pro to run orchestra programs is not cheap. Not only you have to staff, um, you know, with orchestra teachers and and all that, but also you have to make sure also you're supporting that the program. So if anything, as a district, I'm proud of what we're doing and we want to continue doing those kind of things um, and ensuring that our 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 number one is our, our students have all this variety of opportunities. And uh, number two is that our teachers and our students who are do part of these programs are also very well supported, right? So um, I mean we want to continue doing doing all this stuff. So um we don't wanna we don't wanna we don't wanna like um interfere with those kind of things. Does that make sense? We want to try to figure out what our option we have before we can touch those kind of programs. And so I know we're, we're getting closer to um, to 7.30, but the next question, and I think the next series of questions really go back to the budget and trying to understand it more. And um, so the question is, is why don't we use more or some of the surplus funds to op offset the deficit? Even keeping 25% set aside, there's still a lot left. Yeah, so I don't think we can do 25%, and I'm going to let, let Dennis answer this question. I think uh, in order for us to, and as you all know, we get, we over here, we get also um, the state, um, we have to do an audit, financial audit, and the state give us a rating like they do with the A through F academic um, uh, rating. And so in order for us to, to be functioning well, we have to have at least a 90 days worth of um, like funds to operate. Um, but also, it's also that's also that that fund balance also impacts our um, bond rating. So if one day we want to go for a bond and then we need to borrow money, let's say to build or do something here in our district, that could uh, negatively impact if we if we lower that number to uh, uh, a lot more, right? So there is a limit 
in other words, we can maybe, and obviously it's going to be up to our board to make this, uh, to, 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 uh, to give us approval or not, but like we can go to a certain level, but we have to be careful how much we can go. I don't think 25%, it would be, uh, would be a good thing to do because it will hurt our district, uh, uh, hurt our district when it comes to the rating. We can get a lower rating and from the TA and also it will hurt our bonding, our bond rating as well. So, um, fund balance supposed to be more like a one-time thing. Like, for example, if you use it to increase salaries, um, then you have to make sure that you know, you have, you, how are you going to do it the year after and the year after, right? Because you cannot increase salaries one year and then bring them back down another year. You, you want to sustain that, right? And usually fund balance, don't school districts do not use fund balance to increase salaries. Um, our board this year allow us uh, that approved that that nine point five million dollars to give incentives like a retention and and uh, uh, bonuses and and also recruitment bonuses and it's a one time thing now but like if you want to do it year after year that that could I don't think it, we can sustain that. Thank you. And so this next question it goes on um, it, it's asking a question really trying to see. Um, what what we already do and, and if we can increase our, our, our efforts. Um, so have we ever considered tools or do we have anything in place to focus on energy saving to where we put that into our classroom, our, our campuses and our facilities to where it helps us reduce costs, therefore more money can go to the budget? Well, currently uh, we are running very, very efficiently in our utilities. But uh, there is one project out there that we are currently uh, evaluating and that is installing LED lighting throughout the district. Uh, we've had a uh, consultant uh, come in and take a look at that, but there is some up upfront costs associated with changing out all the lights across the whole district and every building, but that is a potential cost savings to the uh, m and budget. All right, thank you, Dennis. Um, this next question is really just trying to understand, I mean, a lot of our budget pays for staffing. And so their question is, realizing that staff salaries are almost 90% of the budget, will cutting from other places really make a difference? Well, if you're going to make a major impact on uh, funding, it would have to come from somewhere in some category of salaries. Uh, but at the time, we're not planning to reduce anyone's salaries. So uh, we, we're hoping that we have funds to increase everybody's salaries. Mm -hmm. And um, so I know we, we briefly talked about this, but I think this question is really related to specific campus resources. So what can parents and community members do to advocate for specific campus resources, like for more assistance, for more uh, support for teachers, for more classroom resources, what, what can they do? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Before before I, I do that, I think it was a question. I saw a question. I don't know if you saw it about, you know, the, the state is saying we receive more money than 6,160. I just want to make it clear to our community and staff here is that the 6,160, that's the basic all, all, allotment. So that's that's what the state thinks uh, you need, a district needs really to, to educate a, a student, a mainstream student. Now, there may be extra funds and there are extra funds that come. For example, if the student is an immersion bilingual, if the student is, um, is living in poverty, right? They qualify for what we call free and reduced lunch. If the student is, uh, uh, an unified special need. So the district gets a little bit extra money for those kind of, um, categories, if you will. And that can help offset some of the other costs that, that may be associated with that. Right. So I just want to make it very clear. So we're talking about basic allotment. That's pretty much, you know, um, for for like um, uh, overall, right? So to answer your questions, uh, your question about um, what else can parents do? And, and I'm, I'm, yes. I'm sorry, before you move on from there, if that the person that answered that question, ask that question, if they can go to slide six of the presentation, those are what we call the old categorical allotments. And they're listed uh, on slide six as the ones you were speaking about. We get additional dollars for special ed students, at-risk students, gift and talented students, students enrolled in CTE, CTE. And we also get uh, additional dollars for safety and security and transportation. Those are outside of the basic allotment. And yeah. I know 
so sorry. I know that Dennis referenced the presentation. So I know that we talked about the video being posted on the website, but the presentation itself will also work to get that so people can have that to reference to um, just so they can they can see. I know that to, if you to reference slide six, we'll go ahead and post it so you guys can see that again. Yeah, thank you. And so, yeah, so obviously, obviously um, the question was how, what can we, do? and I, as I said, I'm, we are very fortunate, uh, very blessed here in Rwanda Kazi because our parents are really very much involved uh, with, with the day-to-day -day, uh, work that we do with our students. So we're we're really again blessed to have them. So some of some of the the things that our parents can do or continue doing, I guess, is really get involved with your, your PTA. Uh, try to volunteer if you have time, if you have a chance. Um, be part of maybe our um, um, if you can, you and your all your, your organization that you worked at is part of like our. Uh, foundation, education foundation, what we call the Pi Foundation. They do amazing work, uh, you know, helping our teachers and taking care of them, um, and also uh, giving scholarships, money to our students, etc. So, I would say get involved with the PTA, volunteer as much as you can, be part of our um, education foundation. They do amazing work there. Um, you know, um, another thing is also advocate, advocate for our students and our uh, district by emailing or calling or, or if you have chance to go and visit with some of our legislators. Uh, I know we sent some information, it's on our website also, but things like that that can help us help our students and help our, our teachers and stuff. I mean, our number one priority is really is going to be moving forward is, is really getting more funds so we can um, retain. And if we need to recruit the best teacher and best staff out there so we can we can ensure that our students are being taken care of and also ensuring that our all our grad programs are well and well funded so they can continue striving right um, and so um you know anything that you can our parents can do um again to get involved with pta Pi foundation legislators just to let them know please fund public education and increase that basic allo allo allocation um we're hoping to be more than ninety dollars. I mean, nine hundred dollars is really again what the Texas controller said. Um, but but uh, every little bit can help us again continue in doing the great work that we do here in Rock ISD. Alrighty, thank you, Doctor Azaiz. We're we're past we're a little bit past seven thirty, so that was our final question for the evening. So I want to thank you guys for joining us, for listening um, to some of the challenges, some of the factors, and for your questions as well, and for allowing us to to share a little bit more, share a little bit more information with you. Um, I know we still had some questions that were left unanswered. We'll be working to, to create an FAQ and put that on our budget site as well. And then also, if you want to reach out to us, if tonight prompts any more questions, please reach out to us via Let's Talk. Again, that is available on our district homepage at roundrockrisd.org. And for those interested in either sharing or watching this again, a recording of this will be on our district's budget website, our district's website, and shared on social media platforms in the coming days. Um, so again, thank you for being with us and I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.